All right, so hello and welcome back to our 20th celebration of Hollis Scarborough's Reading Rope. We are thrilled to have you here for the second in our series with a focus on the strand phonology. Um, I want to thank my colleagues who are here this evening, Andrew Bell, who is our East Literacy Lead, Jeannie Hertzler, who is our uh, Pittsburgh Lead uh, for Literacy, and also Sherry Hartman. Um, and joining us as well, as you know, is Nancy Hennessy, who will be uh, co-leading this uh, with Patton through the series. And even our state lead, our previous state lead, we're so honored to have Deb Fulton with us this evening as well. Uh, we are thrilled and greatly honored to have Dr. Lucy Hart Paulson leading this um, study of phonology. Let me tell you a bit about Dr. Paulson before she begins her presentation. Dr. Lucy Hart Paulson, uh, CCC SLP, is an author and literacy specialist with the mission of bringing research to practice. She is also a speech language pathologist with many years of experience working with educators and with young children and their families in a wide range of educational settings. In addition, Lucy was an associate professor teaching and conducting research in the areas of language and literacy development and disorders. She provides professional development using a broad based perspective, blending areas of language and literacy together, resulting in effective, appropriate and engaging language based literacy instruction and intervention for all children. Finally, Lucy is the co author of language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling letters for early childhood educators second edition building early literacy and language skills, a resource and activity guide for young children and also for Good Talking Words, second edition, a social communication skills program for young children. Uh, I hope you all welcome uh, Dr. Lucy Hart Paulson for this very important conversation about phonology. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Kastner. And I am so honored to have this opportunity to share this time with you. I am I'm so thrilled at the vision that you have had, Pam, for celebrating the reading rope. A, a really important cornerstone um, for quite a long time now in the science of reading and what it is that we need to know and understand in order to make the biggest difference for the children who are in our care. So I wanna thank you and thank Patton for inviting me to share this, this uh, time with you. I also wanna express my deep appreciation for all of the work that Dr. Scarborough has provided for us and her such an eloquent and simple of sort image of the reading rope in illustrating the complexity. And I think it is just quite serendipitous in how the reading rope came to be as a, an image in trying to explain how complex the reading process is for families. So thank you so much. Hollis, for what it is that you have done. And then I want to thank all of you for what it is that you do the things that you do every day, day in and day out in helping students learn the skills that they need to have so that they can become competent readers and also writers. And the, the dedication you have, the commitment and in surviving this year in particular, but thank you. Thank you for what it is that you do. And I hope that in our time together, we'll be able to say some things that confirm what it is you already know, deepen your understanding of this notion of phonological awareness, and be able to um, make some good applications in the settings that you get to participate in and so that we can make that really important difference. So as Pam said, I'm an author, I'm a literacy specialist, I was a faculty member, associate professor, and across all of my career, I've been fascinated with phonology from the very start as a speech and language pathologist, seeing young children who have difficulty learning how to say the sounds of our language, and then following them along and and, uh, and experiencing that almost all of them were back in a special education referral process a couple of years later, generally second into third grade, because now they were having difficulty learning how to read the sounds of our language. And way back then, decades and decades and decades and one more decade ago, we had this understanding that the reading process, when it didn't go well, it was some kind of vision issue. And we know so much better today. 
and a lot of the work that we know about today comes from Hollis and the Reading Rope. I remember way back, even before the Reading Rope came out, uh, Keith Stanovich made a comment in the early 90s saying, one of the shining stars from the then recent reading research was the contribution that of an understanding of the contribution that phonological awareness has in the reading process. One of those big shining stars. And it was a deal breaker in our understanding of how reading works. So in my, in my uh, understanding and sense of the, what I love to read about anything that I can on phonological awareness, I want to share with you. So let me see. I've got some uh, throughout all of my career. I've done all uh, as a faculty member. I, I did a lot of uh, content. The courses I got to teach were in the areas of language and literacy development and disorders, and certainly spent a good deal of time on phonological awareness. And then any of the research projects that uh, were on my research agenda also included a lot of uh, connections to phonological awareness. So here's what I would like to share with you. Look at some research updates. Where are we today? Where have we come from and where we are today in our understanding of this notion of phonological awareness? One of those vital strands in the reading rope. I want to talk a little bit about assessment, what we need to identify, what we need to think about, when we need to think about certain kinds of assessment strategies and approaches, and then talk about some instruction and intervention strategies. When I think about the research aspect, I want to make sure that we have a really clear understanding of what the purpose of a particular research study was trying to um, identify, what the findings were trying to, what they're telling us, and what the question was. Because we have research that has given us a very good understanding of the developmental processes of phonological awareness, and that is pretty much settled science. We know how young children develop and grow across the infant toddler preschool into the early elementary grades in the development of phonological um, awareness. We also have research that guides us in terms of what it is we need to assess. And we have research that guides us in terms of what, do, uh, what kinds of instructional approaches do we have that are going to make important differences in young children's lives and the students who are in our care. And we have instructional or we have research that looks at intervention. So what we also know is that when we have to move into an intervention kind of uh, context, we have students that are not learning the strategies or the skills that we want them to know or that we would hope that they are learning and that's impacting their ability to read and write in competent ways. We have, we've got some really excellent research and, and back even in the early 2000s, a lot of the time when some of the work that was being done when Hollis was working on the reading rope and the things that she was interested in, and it was the Shaywitz's work and the technology that was available then and the enhanced technology that is available to us now and being able to jump inside the brains of people and seeing what's going on in brains when reading is working well and when reading is not working well. And what we identified and have identified for quite a long time is that when there is reading difficulty, the challenge comes down to a very kernel nugget of phonology. In Shaywitz's work, identifying that 88% of the folks that they were doing functional MRIs on had some weakness, some underlying weakness in the phonological processing system. And that certainly includes phonological awareness. So we have a lot to talk about. And what I want to share with you is, let's see, I have a participation guide that I want to share. And it looks a little bit like this. So let me move to another slide here. So a little bit like this. So it was in the on the Padlet. I think. And so take that. If you had an opportunity to print it, great. We do know that actually writing something by hand makes learning for us, makes learning for our children stickier. This handwriting piece is a really valuable strategy. And so in that, 
uh, guide, there are several things. When you see this little key here, that is going to be a key to the participation guide that we have. So I want to start out with a few queries for you. So let's think about this. And these are listed on that guide. See where you're at with this. So true or false, phonological awareness requires alphabet letters. And I hope your response was false. Phonological awareness has to deal with sounds. We often think that sounds are auditory. That's absolutely the case. But speech sounds also have a kinesthetic connection that we have that's going on with your mouth. When you think about saying the sound that's represented by the letter M, you think about saying M mm, or saying many or mom, your area right up here, if you put your hand right on the temple of your, the left side of your brain, that's where the Broca's area is and that's where your articulation production is. Even if you think about saying that, that area is activated. So think about phonology as importantly sounds. There's a kinesthetic component, component in what the articulatory gesture is. And from a young child's perspective, there's a really important visual perspective because they wanna watch your mouth and see what that looks like in the way that you are saying that sound. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Thinking about young children, and I'm thinking about uh, toddlers, preschoolers in this kind of young, what did they learn to manipulate or play with first, syllables or sounds? And if you said, if you said syllables, you're exactly right. It is that bigger chunk and a more natural rhythmic chunk of language. Syllables are really important elements of oral language. And they're a really important element in our understanding of the phonological processing um, systems that we have. So they, they're, uh, they're ones that we really do not want to get rid of. Okay, think about this word fix. How many sounds does the word fix have? And if you said, eh, careful, k, s, for speech sounds, you are correct because that letter X, as we know, represents two speech sounds. Okay, how about this word catch? How many speech sounds in this word? And if you said k, a, ch, mm -hmm. three sounds in that particular word. All right, so here's a, here's a very specific question and with a specific answer. What phonological awareness skill at the beginning of kindergarten, so that translates leaving pre-K, moving into kindergarten, is strongly predictive of literacy learning down the road in late second grade, even into third grade? What phonological awareness skill? And if you said initial sound identification, you are right on target. Being able to respond to, here's a cup. What does cup start with? And you say, k, not C, but k. What does dog start with? And a child's able to say, d. What does giraffe start with? And a child can say, j. That is one of those elements and that then guides from an application perspective, what should we be assessing and making sure that children are gaining that. And if we're assessing it, then we're going to be teaching it. All right. So Hollis in her reading rope, she published that in this book, which I scoured through several times. And here's a quote from what she identifies in that set in, in her chapter in the handbook for early literacy research. Among the stronger predictors, only, what is that? Phonological awareness has yet been demonstrated to play a causal, very important connection, causal role in learning to read. A successful intervention program would thus certainly include training this skill, because connecting phonological awareness with letter knowledge has been shown to enhance the acquisition of the alphabetic principle, this too should be a focus. So because we have an alphabet, there's that PH in the middle, 
we want to make that and the connection of that symbol to the sound a clear understanding from a child's perspective and developing that skill of understanding what a phoneme is or what a sound is and being able to identify and isolate and identify it. So that was in two th or, uh, 20 years ago. What are some updates? Well, in Susan Brady's article in the reading journal just uh, fairly recently, there's convergent evidence for the importance of phoneme awareness and letter skills for learning to read. It's indisputable. The science of reading, when you talk to those cognitive science scientists, there's one way that we learn how to read. And it's understanding what the symbol is and knowing what that symbol spells, what that symbol represents. Okay, so here's, here's some ponders for you. What's your sense of your understanding of these pH terms? There are a lot of them and they all sound a lot alike. What's your sense between the difference between what phonological and phonemic awareness is? Feeling pretty good about it or mm, that still was a little bit itchy. How about your understanding of phonological naming, phonological retrieval, phonological recoding? Any distinctions or differences between and among those? How about your understanding of phonological working memory? Okay, phonological sensitivity. And that is a term that's been thrown around a little bit. I have some, uh, I, ha I have a, a connection that I wanna share with you and see what you think about. Uh, and one more, phonological representation. So in our notion and conversation of phonological awareness, all of these components are uh, important ones to have a good slot in our glossary for what they mean and how they connect. And this information is shared in the letters uh, manual that I had the incredible honor to write with Louisa Motes in the letters for early childhood educators. And I wanna just share a little bit about phonological processing and what we have identified, and thanks to Joe Torgerson, three component skills that make up phonological processing. And it's phonological awareness, phonological naming, phonological working memory. So do this task. Say the word tiger. I can read your lips. Thank you. Say it again and don't say g. And you came out with a new word. So in doing that pretty advanced phonological, phonemic actually, phonemic awareness task, you used all three of those component skills. With your phonological working memory, let's start over at the, the right side. With your phonological working memory, you had to hold that word tiger in your head for a short period of time. With your phonological awareness skills, phonemic awareness specifically, you had to extract the g sound. And now you had to, in that middle section, phonological naming, you had to recode what that word should be without the g sound. And you were able to recode that word to be able to say tire. So from a definition perspective, when I share this information with the early childhood educators I get to uh, interact with, I think there are two important elements to the definition of phonological awareness. It is the ability to consciously, so consciously manipulate the sound syllables and sound patterns in oral language. And when it's only a phoneme, when it's at that smallest nugget, phoneme is the distinction between phonological broader and phonemic awareness. So those two. It's intentional and you're able to play with the syllables and sounds of, of uh, language. Okay, phonological naming. I wish that this term would have been called retrieval and not naming. Phonological retrieval is being able to come up with very quickly the words that we know, that we have stored. Think about this kind of context in the settings that you're in. And as an example of what your own phonological retrieval or phonological naming might be. <laughs> so have you ever called 
one student by another student's name. Seen a little giggling? Mm -hmm. That was an issue with your own phonological retrieval. They were housed in the same area because those, those words were neighbors from a lexical perspective and, the, and the, uh, another child's name came up instead of the one that you were really intentionally trying to say. Another example is when you feel like there's a word on the tip of your tongue, trying to retrieve that word is a good example of what phonological retrieval is. And we know from an assessment perspective that rapid automatic naming is such a valuable task in identifying how a student's phonological processing system is working. It's a great assessment tool. And that is a retrieval, um, it's a retrieval task. Okay, and then we have phonological working memory. And this is important to think about from a, it's a short term perspective. Words come in, we do something with them for a little bit and then they disappear. Here's another example that you might relate to in terms of your own phonological working memory. So think about a situation where you met somebody new. You didn't, uh, they didn't have a name tag, but they told you what their, your name was. And then you have a generic conversation generally about the weather or something. And 10 seconds later or so, what happened to that person's name inside your phonological working memory? Did it evaporate? Gone? Mm -hmm. Now, what would have happened in that same kind of context if the person had the same name as your mother? Now, would it, would it evaporate? No, you would tag it because you have a much greater connection to that particular word. And that is what this little piece is in the bottom of this, uh, of this diagram, phonological representation. So, what about that? Um, so let me ask, let me, let me share this with you from a, giving you some examples of your experience with phonological processing. Here's an experience that I had and see what you think the issue is with this young student, a five-year-old in kindergarten. And I was working with this little friend on some phonological, actually phonemic awareness skills by this time. What is the issue? in this child's phonological processing? Was it phonological awareness? Was it phonological naming or phonological memory? And so I pulled an item out of my grab bag. I've got it in my hand and I say to this little friend, guess what I have? I have a f -i -sh. And he says, ish. Almost went straight again. So I repeat it. Tell me again, here it is again. Ish. And again, he says, ish. All right, so I was at a task here. I needed to step it down. So what should I have done or what did I do? I went to that lower level in the sequence of development of phonological awareness. So I said, okay, try one more time, you share. Tell me what this is. And I said, it's a fish. And he got it. It's a fish. Now, look at his phonological awareness. Was he able to take some pieces that were spread out apart and put them together? Was he able to blend the elements that I was saying and blend them together? He said ish, which was combining i and sh together. So he could blend those. Was he able to come up with some recoding of what it was that I said? Mm -hmm. What was the issue? He could hold on to two parts. He could not hold on to three parts. So it was his phonological working memory that was an issue, not his phonological awareness. But what we also know from our research is that phonological working memory is one of those things that can be enhanced as phonological naming can be enhanced when we, when we have better, stronger, phonological awareness skill. Okay, so there's that. Okay, phonological representation. This little friend said, I wanna make the alligator go up. 
What word did this little friend really want to say? Elevator, but did not have that stored in his long-term memory. And that's what phonological representation is. And that's a really important aspect in the items that we choose for phonological awareness activities. So phonological representation, it is part of phonological processing. And this work comes from Gail Gillen. It's an important part of, of speech perception and very importantly as part of vocabulary. When you think about wanting to learn a new word, you, not, you have to not only understand and know the meaning of that word, but you have to know and understand what that word, um, what the structure of it is, what the pronunciation of it is. And it's really highly connected to naming and that phonological retrieval. Okay, how about this one? Rhinoceroses are ancestors and, and brothers to dinosaurs with one horn. So what was the word held, held in that little friend's phonological representation? Sister. And if you have an and sister, then of course you should also have to have an and brother. Figuring out how you can play with that word and that syllable connection to be able to <laughs> come up with, make up new words. So, and, and once again, it's that how pronunciations of words are stored and how those words are stored and that segmental aspect of what we know about words is necessary for explicit phonemic awareness. So an important connection to phonological awareness. Okay, so one more I want to share with you, and this is a term phonological sensitivity from a range of researchers who are identifying and tagging a connection, a semantic connection to this term phonological sensitivity. And in my mind, from an early literacy perspective, working in that more in that preschool uh, perspective, we can go even lower. And what I what I love about the recent research or the, looking at the span of phonological awareness research, when Hollis was doing the reading rope, much of the research was being done on kinder, first, second graders. Not a whole lot. There was not yet a lot of information that was being done in preschool. But remember when it used to be that kids started to learn about literacy when they got to kindergarten? Oh, and then, oh wait, we know better. That actually starts happening in preschool. And that's why universal preschool would be such a wonderful thing for our country. It is a big thing in a lot of other countries. So we know that preschool, and pre there are a lot of things that are happening. And so then that's bird, but wait, there are things that are happening in children as they are infants and toddlers that are contributing mm. to phonological uh, awareness for their literacy development. And so the definition of phonological sensitivity from this group of researchers is looking at that time period when infants and toddlers are becoming sensitive to the syllable patterns, the speech sounds that are in the language that they are loved in. So this little friend is saying, donatar, donatar, which really means, what does he want to do? He wants to go in the car. Now, if he's two, he's got his little blankie in his tab, his sippy cup. If he's two, that's okay because he's still in that sensitive, that development period when speech sounds articulation is still progressing. His, phon his uh, phonological processing is still developing. If this little friend is four or five and is still speaking in that regard, we're gonna have to look at some intervention because we know during that phonological sensitivity time period, those speech patterns did not develop. So another element and layer to phonological sensitivity is that this is where rhyme sensitivity emerges with speech sound sensitivity or speech sound development. So here's my little granddaughter. When she was, uh, when she was a toddler, she has a hat. Her hat also happened to be in the shape of a cat. And in order for her to learn those words, she had to figure out it's a subconscious. She's certainly not aware of that, but she had to figure out what the difference is in how you say cat and how you say hat. And when babies, toddlers 
are moving to that level of sensitivity is when the vocabulary explosion takes place, which generally starts on average at about um, 18 months to 24 months of age in a toddler's development. So think about this. How many of you are working with students who are learning English as another language? And well established in the development of learning another language is the silent period where students are listening to the language, this new language that they are being exposed to. And in that silent period, it is an important element of phonological sensitivity. They are becoming sensitive to the sound structures, the syllable patterns and the rhythm of that new language. And for any of you who have tried to learn a, another language as an adult, and I ask you this question, when you listen to a native speaker of that language, what does the rate sound like to you? Does it sound like it's so fast? That's because you have not had the advantage of going through that phonological sensitivity time period to become sensitive to the sound structures, the syllable patterns, and importantly, the word boundaries of that language. And that's what makes their, that rate sound so quickly to, for, to you because you are not understanding what, what, um, what that person is saying because you don't have, you're not sensitive to the phonologic structure of that new language. Okay, so when we think about phonological sensitivity, we have good research, several different studies that have identified it develops before babies are even born. Uh, babies born up to three months premature are able to, in, in certain experiments, been, been able to recognize differences in syllables um, from a uh, studies that have been done on, on uh, babies before they're born, able to, uh, with different neurologic reactions, being able to distinguish or show changes in uh, reaction to different syllables and to different pitch levels, male voices versus female voices. Pretty cool. When I think about word boundaries, I wanted to throw this in. Here are Dolly and Billy walking home from school and Billy or Dolly is saying, well, Mrs. Clark is reading us The Ugly Duckling by Hans Christian and her son <laughs> instead of Anderson. And I would submit this. Some of the funny things we have stories of from our students of funny things that they have said. And I, bought a, I bet a lot of the basis to why that funny, why it's so funny, has a lot to do with a child's phonological processing system. <laughs> okay, so let's quickly do these. Um, a child saying, is this phonological sensitivity or representation? So a child saying, this was a first grader saying, it's hard for me to memorize. What do you think? Sensitivity, the speech sounds there correctly, or is it representation and not having those words stored well? Representation. How about this one? That little friend saying donatar. We already had that. That's phonological sensitivity. How about this one? A three-year-old asking if grandpa is available. <laughs> All the speech sounds are correct but that word is not yet represented as exactly as we want it to be. Yeah, she's got all the syllables, but not all quite in the same order. How about this one? A, a little friend saying, I, I wiped a wet one. Sounds are not what we want them to be. So that's a sensitivity piece. How about, and one more, um, wanting to turn the channel on the TV and then asking for the marote. representation. And so you see how helping children, in order to help children say those bigger words, we break them apart into syllables, we structure those syllables so that they can build a really important, establish a really important phonological representation of those words. Okay, so let's drill down further into phonological awareness. And Chris Lonigan has been one of those researchers who has helped us understand a lot of what's going on in those developmental time periods. And sorting out that there are two separate constructs of phonological awareness. There's a rhyming skill and there's a blending and segmenting skill. And you'll see that I have attached the term alliteration to blending and segmenting. And 
a little closer look. This has been a well-established connection that synthesis putting things together is another term that you can see being used for blending. And this is a really important skill for putting this into a written language context and needed for decoding words. Seeing what those sounds are and putting them together. Where on the other side, analysis is connected very much with segmenting, where they're isolating, some, isolating a sound, uh, being able to classify or identify a sound, and then phoneme um, analysis. It's needed from an orthographic perspective for spelling and for rapid sightword recognition. So really important connection from an oral language perspective. And also we know so much uh, from a written language perspective. Okay, so we have this progression um, Kilpatrick has written about this, but he described it based on a lot of other research. As I've said, it's uh, phonological awareness from a developmental perspective is settled science. So we have early phonological awareness, which is occurring in infants and toddlers. And they're being able to play with syllables and being able to detect rhyme. When you think about singing the song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, what are you naturally doing with the syllables in the word Twinkle and Little? You are segmenting, pulling them apart and playing with them in a way that is different than how you say those words in natural conversational speech. At the basic level of phonological awareness, it is uh, preschool into first grade. And the tasks that are involved or the skills that are involved at that level is learning to segment and blend initial sounds first, final sounds, and then individual sounds and single syllable words. And then moving into a more complex level from a receptive rhyme into an expressive rhyming opportunity. And then advanced phonological awareness is first grade and beyond. And that's where you are able to, because you have a higher level of cognition, a greater level of um, language use and awareness, you're able to, and your working memory has expanded, you're able to participate in some of these more complex manipulation tasks. All right, another element that I want to share with you, um, uh, Chris Lonigan, Jason Anthony, have, uh, and, and a lot of the team that they work with, looking at two dimensions within phonological awareness, and it's the linguistic dimension as well as the cognitive dimension. And so from a linguistic perspective, language perspective, as children get older, their language, oral language is developing, cognition is developing, and so they can move to smaller and smaller, more abstract units of speech. So from syllables to phonemes. And also more familiar words are easier for children to manipulate because it doesn't tax your working memory as well. From a cognitive perspective, skills to be uh, considering in doing phonological awareness activities or working memory, a sense of matching as opposed to a sense of oddity. Which one sounds the same or which one does not sound the same? When you put the oddity task to it, you're adding another dimension or another layer of complexity to that task. And what we also know is that cognitive abilities seem to parallel linguistic development. But this is still another, uh, another uh, element that we have not established exactly in the research is that exact progression remains uh, to be specified. And so there's this sense of reciprocal nature of language and understanding the structure of words to being able to say more words. So you're able to say more structures and you're able to say more words, but that still has to be specified in the research. So as a cognitive example, how many items can young children keep in their phonological memory? About two, this would be at a preschool level. As you get older, that working memory becomes larger and you can hold more units. Here's another, a linguistic example. So segment the syllables in this word. Thanks, Megan. I can see you clapping. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Kangaroo. Cool. Okay, now segment the syllables in this word. Oh, wait. How many have to, have to break that word apart into syllables in order to say it? It's a cool word. It's a synecdoche. You say it. 
Let's do it slowly. Synecda key. Uh huh. See how valuable syllables are in vocabulary development? Synecda key. <laughs> You're going to love this. Or I hope you love this as much as I do. It's a figure of speech. It's a figure of speech that takes a part of something to represent the whole. Say it to your neighbor. A synecda key is a part of something that represents the whole. Like, give me a hand. Or what kind of wheels do you drive? A part, synecda key. So syllables are important. It's important to our um, vocabulary development. All right, this looks very familiar to I'm sure, the linguistic hierarchy where we start out with words and then we have syllables. Both take, so identify what the word boundaries are in a sentence. <clears throat> take a multisyllabic word and identify what the syllables are. And then take a word and move it to the phonemic awareness level where you have what's the beginning sound. And then to the top of this hierarchy of a word is take a single syllable word and identify what all the parts are. This mirrors what that developmental sequence is. And when we think about phonological sensitivity, it is this lowest step on the hierarchy. You become sensitive to what the word boundaries are because you are becoming sensitive to what words are. A really important aspect. It's not a phonological awareness skill, actually. It's a phonological sensitivity skill with the definition that, that we're using for phonological sensitivity. And then we know that all of the rest of those are phonological awareness. And then when we get to those top two steps, when we're focusing on that kernel, the phoneme, it is phonemic awareness. And so these two lower steps are the early phases, levels of phonological awareness. And that top phase is the end of the basic level of phonological awareness. Okay, I have a new term for you. This is a new connection that we have and it's called epilinguistic. You say it? Epilinguistic. Mm -hmm. You could say that pretty well because you also are quite familiar with the term metalinguistic. And what epilinguistic is, is that implicit sensitivity to language that occurs before you are consciously aware of what word structures are. It is what my granddaughter was doing when she was learning the word cat and hat. She could say both of them. She knew the difference in what they were from an object perspective. And she knew how to say them in a different way, even though they sounded a lot alike at the end. Okay, so what is happening is that in this epilinguistic awareness, children, young children are singing songs and they're, they're playing and singing the rhythm that goes along with the song and how that song is supposed to go or finger play. And, and they're hearing the detect, they're detecting how words sound alike. Remember reading a, a book like, um, there's a walk it in my pocket and kids giggle because they hear how silly some of those words sound. They're hearing how they sound alike. They're, they don't really know why but they are tuning into the structure of those words. And then we move to metalinguistic, which we know from a meta perspective, intentionally thinking about. So if we have our hierarchy back and we have our basic and early, where do epilinguistic and metalinguistic live on the hierarchy? And you will know that, yep, epilinguistic is this lower level of the hierarchy followed by metalinguistic that moves up into that next, those next stages. Okay, I wanna quickly share a, uh, a study that I did. This was the, a couple, number of years ago, <laughs> quite a number of years ago. And looking at the, uh, what I was hoping to do was identify what are the easiest phonological awareness skills and followed by the hardest phonological awareness skills. And there were 10 skills two in the area of rhyming, two in the area of initial sound or alliteration, two in the area of, uh, or three uh, in blending and segmenting. And so in looking at this sequence of progression and, you, uh, and the, the shading is, is uh, intentional in that the first four skills of syllable blending and segmenting, rhyme detection and alliteration categorization, and what that meant is finding a word that begins with this, with this particular sound. Think of dibbles and uh, the original dibbles in the initial sound fluency. Here are some words, which one starts like this? 
Uh, so all in that first four, those were the four uh, skills that were the easiest for a group of four-year-olds and a group of five-year-olds pre-kindergarten kids. Okay, and then moving into the middle group, blending onset and rhyme units, alliteration detection, that is looking at pictures and identifying which two start with the same sound and rhyme production, same grouping of skills for the five-year-olds, but they are developing at a higher level. And then look at these bottom ones, the seven, the eight, nine, and 10 developing skills and the percentage correct for both four and five-year-old children. We get down to this last one, segmenting phonemes, which we know is not expected in preschool at all. But what is the, ac the um, accuracy level? And this is without any kind of instruction. Children were not in any kind of an educational setting. The kids coming into preschool are beginning to think about beginning sounds, like it is blending onset and rhyme, beginning that onset business, but it still is a really difficult abstract skill for young children. Okay, so I have this progression and looking at the time, got too many slides trying to pack into a whole lot of uh, into our conversation. This is, a, this is a, a table that I have in uh, letters for early childhood educators in identifying what is that development. So we have phonological awareness, um, a developmental progression. And so we have phonemic awareness as a component of phonologic awareness. And we have these two constructs, rhyming, blending and segmenting, and rhyming. And so in rhyme, we have words and songs, we're going to match words that rhyme, and then we're going to produce words that rhyme. And then in this notion of blending and segmenting, we're going to take words apart by syllables. And then we're going to shift, then we're going to move to um, a, words by initial sound and for and that we could also call alliteration. And first we're gonna detect what that initial sound is and then learn to detect the final sounds in words. Um, this is also called onset at an initial level and identify initial sounds, so detection and then identifying. And then moving to individual sounds in words. And first, simple words, CVC words, then to uh, words that have consonant blends in them. And then what's going to happen is we move into those higher level. Now we've moved from beyond basic into that more advanced or complex manipulations. And this earliest phase over on that left-hand side is what epilinguistic is. And then this phase where now we are intentionally playing with the sound structures in words, and that is metalinguistic. Now, this is a progression, and there's a really important symbolic nature of those arrows that bleed into another. It is not that it is a stepwise piece but it is a general trend in a progression. And if a word is more familiar to a student who is participating in a phonological awareness activity, then that, because there's less tax on phonological memory and probably less tax on the phonological retrieval because that word has stronger phonological representation, you may be able to manipulate that word at a higher level. Okay, so we have metalinguistic to proficient, and then we can put early basic into advanced in uh, along on this schedule. So I hope that just putting a lot of those pieces into a diagram, I can't take advantage, uh, you know, this is, this would be my approach to, uh, to Hollis's rope from a phonological, taking phonological awareness and detailing out the specificities of that. Okay, and so you'll notice that I put onset and alliteration in parentheses. And here's another little thought that I'd like to just leave with you. If we would agree, the definition of onset is that initial consonant or consonants preceding a vowel um, in a syllable. And then the rhyme is the vowel or in an orthographic perspective, there may be more than one vowel letter. And then following consonants and, and the following the consonants in that syllable. So in the word rate, the onset is r. And in the word trait, the onset is tr. In the word straight, the onset is str. In the word eight, oh, oh, wait. No onset. 
But there is a beginning sound in every one of those words, and each beginning sound is different. The beginning sound in rate is ra, which does match up with the onset. Beginning sound in trait is t, s, a. Mm -hmm. And so what Gail Gillen in her more recent her phonological awareness book, Research to Practice, what I really appreciated about this book is her conversation and discussion of a, let's have a contemporary understanding and distinction between R-I-M-E and R-H-Y-M-E, which are words that sound the same at the end. So these words rhyme, bite, light, weight, gate, bait, feet, meat. And these words have a rhyme, R-I-M-E and an R-H-Y-M-E, bite, kite, gate, light, feet, beat. And so in our phonological awareness context, Let's just keep it simple. Let's call it an initial sound because that is going to be much more accurate and we're going to give better information to our students. So we can think of that R-H-Y-M-E as a phonological oral language context. And we can think of the orthographic context when we think about um, the R-I-M-E and the onset. Because truly what we should be doing in when we have an onset, if we use the purest definition of onset with our five, six-year-old children and say, what's the onset of the word train? The onset is tr. But we want children to be able to parse out. The goal is to parse out each, in, in each individual sound. And so we can just keep it simple and say initial sound. All right, so how are you feeling about these terms? Better? I hope. All right, so let's look at some assessment connections. So what we do know, and this work comes from Tim Shanahan and Chris Lonigan's work, and we know that from an assessment perspective, performance-based tasks provide much more reliable and valid assessment data than do observations or checklists for early literacy skills. And phonological awareness is one of those elements. Using a, a performance-based task is important. And um, from a pre-kindergarten situation, this is much, it's a much bigger conversation than it is in kindergarten uh, for a second grade. And the important thing to do is get the best information that we can in the shortest period of time, because then we can get on to, we know what it is that students need from us and we can get on to the instruction. We also know that the two best predictors of reading achievement in early kindergarten that predict second grade literacy learning are phonemic awareness, science, sound isolation, and the second one is letter name knowledge. It's information from the National Reading Panel and the National Early Literacy Panel. And I wanna just circle this because there's this also, this could be another webinar at some point um, and work that I have done. There's also this confusion that, that uh, letter sounds are more important in these phases, in this pre-K, early kindergarten level. But actually, the better the, be the better predictor of reading achievement at the beginning of kindergarten is letter name knowledge, not letter sound knowledge. Okay, so I wanted to just reference this uh, study that was done by Hugh Katz. What another giant in our uh, in the science of reading. Uh, and it's a battery, a screening battery in kindergarten that includes letter name fluency, phonemic awareness, rapid naming, non-word repetition. And you look at these, how many of these have a phonologic basis to it? Is there a basis to letter name fluency, saying letters as fast as you can? Mm -hmm. It's called rapid naming. Phonemic awareness or sound matching? It's easy. Rapid naming, again, is another one of the fits into that phonological processing piece. Non-word repetition also is needed for word recoding. You hear a word, you hold it in your short-term working memory, and you recode it. Look at how much of that screening battery in kindergarten is related to the phonology aspect. So from a rapid automatic naming I wanted to just have a moment to share a, a little bit um, of thoughts that I've had or what the research is identifying is that the RAN tasks are more relevant at different ages and different instructional levels. And so when you have younger students, the whole point about a RAN task is to be naming something quickly that you know really well. 
the items you need to know really well. And so a letter fluency task gives you an, uh, in kindergarten, gives you an idea based on the, the psychometric data that, uh, that tools like um, Acadience Learning or um, Ames Web, any of those have done a lot of work to figure out. But if you have a concern about rapid automatized naming or that skill with a young child, what you wanna do is include elements that have objects, familiar and common objects, colors or shapes. Those are gonna be more predictive of literacy, learning and development for younger students. And that would be tagged before reading instruction, where later, once reading instruction has begun and those vocabulary sets of letter names are set and they are at a more automatized or um, children know them well, then they become more um, better predictors for older students. Uh, and there is a, so that's RAN. I wanted to also just have a, a conversation about the benefit that RAN has or phonological awareness skills and RAN. And what the, what Clayton and colleagues have identified is that Phoneme awareness, letter sound knowledge, alpha numeric, so looking at letters, naming letters, naming numbers or numerals, those are all strong predictors of reading development. Hold that in place with the age of the students that this study is representing. And what we know is RAN is not anything that we teach, but it is when we build stronger phonological awareness skills then it has a reciprocal effect or impact on rapid automatic naming. So that was that was a big piece of what Clayton's uh, what what that research study was looking at in that longitudinal study. Okay, so let's have a quick check in. These are those screening indicators that Cat helped us understand. How about instructional targets? So letter name fluency is a good screening tool. Do we teach letter names to children? Shake your head like this. Yes, we do. Uh, phonemic awareness. Do we teach phonemic awareness? Yes, we do. Rapid naming. Is that a skill that we teach? No. It is a great assessment tool, but it is not an instructional uh, skill that we want to teach. How about non-word repetition? Like, say this word, galipadop. <laughs> do we teach that? Gonna put a little asterisk that by that and let's put it into a context for a young child if a young child has never heard a word before is it an unfamiliar or a non-word to them yeah and so what do we do we say it we break it apart we help them string those syllables together so that they're able to say that in an accurate way there there's a a lot of tools that are available that can give us good information in assessing. Um, from a preschool perspective, there's the PELI. And uh, another preschool uh, task would be the IGDES, my IGDES. There's a, there's a second edition that is available. It's been out for a number of years. Um, PALS has a pre-K and a kindergarten screening. Really Great Reading has a phonological awareness survey and it's free. Uh, there's, uh, Kilpatrick has um, the PAST, it's also free. And there's another past that Zonk put together and it uh, starts in, uh, it's related mostly for kindergarten, but it has a lot of those skills if you are working in an earlier context that you can go down into those preschool levels. And here's the importance of the assessment process. Screening helps us know who's at benchmark and who's not. And for those kids who are not, we need to do some instruction, see if it is because they haven't had the experience and the exposure, or if there is some kind of brain issue going on, um, across, um, and there may be some level of dyslexia. And when you look at the deficits, how much of these components are related to phonology? Phonological awareness, rapid automatized naming, verbal working memory is phonologically based, letter knowledge, has a, has a really important phonological connection to it. And oral language and vocabulary, that vocabulary piece also is connected to phonology. Those are really strong predictors or precursors that we can look at. And then when we look at risk, the importance of assessment, risk can be identified in preschool and kindergarten children with 50 to 70% accuracy when we measure these things. 
phonology, 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 phonology. All of them have that kernel of, of uh, phonology. When we move into first grade, 92% accuracy, nonword fluency is a phonological naming task. Oral reading fluency has certainly connections to phonological naming, responsiveness to intervention, and the, then that listening, reading comprehension, de detectiveness. But you can see how important this phonological component has in our conversation. All right. So you all teaching phonological awareness. There are a lot of tools that are available. Um, what we know is early intervention, early instruction is really important. When we have identified that a student is not where we hope or expect them to be, we know that early intervention is four times more effective than later intervention. Look at the return on investment for every dollar that is spent on different studies. Take that to your school board. Waiting one year diminishes the effectiveness of that intervention by about 25 to 50%. And we can re risk prediction with 60 to 80% accuracy with those indicators that we just talked about. And so Fumiko um, have to identify structured literacy instruction works for all. And it's absolutely necessary for some. And so when we do phonological awareness, we want to make sure we know what the age expectations are. So let's do this. Age expectations, and we're talking preschool into kinder first grade. When do students begin, to, when do kids begin, or when are, when are they working on blending and segmenting syllables? And if you said three to four, mm -hmm. three years to four years of age, that's when that is occurring. When, uh, when should children, when are children working on rhyme matching? One's a pretty broad range, three to five years of range. Not that we have time to talk about that right now, but it's not, I think, an artifact of the research and the types of tasks that different research studies used in identifying what those findings are. Um, how about initial sound segmentation? When, is, when are kids working on that? And I hope you said four to five years, that pre-K kindergarten year. How about rhyme production? Rhyme production, frankly, is hard. How many of you know kids that just don't get rhyme? On the other side of that, how many of you know kids that just get it? They ju it just seems to flow. Mm -hmm. Because rhyme production is actually a pretty high level manipulation task of removing one sound, coming up with another one, and placing that on the rhyme aspect of that word. How about um, segmenting single the sounds in a single syllable word? That's a five to six year old skill that from the common core and I think rightly and developmentally appropriate is an end of kindergarten skill. How about working on sound manipulations? Those are for older students, older kids, older from my context where I get to focus a lot on pre K, <laughs> but certainly first grade, second grade. Because children's language is developed, they're a lot more, they're a lot, uh, a lot more things. Their ability to, to uh, think on a much more abstract net level is much more in place. So what we need to do is make sure in our instruction, we have some attention to teaching phonological awareness explicitly. You may use some kind of program, great, or you may come up with it on your own. There is no exact perfect program out there yet, but there are really wonderful things that in, are in all of the programs. We also can do implicit phonological awareness where we embed wordplay into a lot of our routines. And just on a note, most early learning curriculums, most core curricula in uh, phonics teaching children to read, you most likely are going to need to enhance your phonological awareness instruction. Okay, so rhyme routines that we can go through, rhyming children's names and taking attendance, changing the beginning sound in their name um, to create a rhyme, lots of rhymes um, in the directions that we use. We're gonna go to the bribery. What did you have to do? You had to take the BR off and then put in the old sound to say, oh, library. Lots of, uh, point out, intentionally point out words that rhyme. So many ideas. See how these match up in, uh, for those of you who work with kinders and first graders. Change the children's name to the sound corresponding to the letter pattern that you're particularly working on. Like who's here today and you're working on the K sound or the M sound, Mariss is here, Mavid, 
mom, use an alphabetic chart. Let's see if I can find if I got any of my strategies out. Use the a, here's that ABCI chart that I've written about for a number of years. So the ABC chart, ABCI chart is what I like to call it. And it is the alphabet song in the order and the pattern, the alphabet in the pattern of the song. And so you just go through this, circle the, the vowels. So you don't have to focus on those, but we're gonna have a word like, um, gonna have a word, let's do boat, okay? Boat, and now we're gonna rhyme it with coat. Dote, fote, goat, hote, jote, coat, just playing with words that rhyme. And having kids, there's a connection to a letter. They also have to think about what that word might sound like. Um, so many things that we can do. Some hints that we want to use or think about with phonological awareness. Now let's think about segmenting and blending. Use motions or use gestures. When I do syllables, I have a new word. It's called kinemes. Let's say it. Kinemes, it comes from the word kinesthetic. And as I talked about that mouth gesture, it connects to that. But you have some kind of movement. Movement makes things sticky for kids. And so syllables, I like to use bigger. So it's a bigger syllable. I like to use my arm. When I talk about phonemes, I like to use my fingers. That gives kids um, an, another connection to make it sticky. Highlight the mouth gesture. So having a mirror that you can look at, that children can look at is important. Here's where I think in our, in our uh, context of COVID and the mask, having a mask that has, a, has a, uh, a clear element to it can be one element of making that visual nature. It doesn't, uh, it's still muffled and we're in such an interesting time and and having children hear us real clearly. Um, you wanna have about one second pause in between the segments that you're using, either syllables or sounds. The gesture helps to uh, make that pause. We're gonna make sure that you say the sounds very explicitly and crisply. It's not da, ah, g, that would be da, ah, g. It's da, ah, g. Um, and we know that syllables are easier than words, beginning sounds, or uh, initial sounds children are able to identify, followed by final sounds, followed by middle sounds. And when you have two consonants together, that makes that word harder. Okay, so blending and root, uh, segmenting routines, lots of things. I'm gonna go through these. You have them uh, in the handout. Lots of things that we can do in playing and building our phonological awareness blending and segmenting skills. And it is so important. You know, there's a big conversation uh, going around today about get to the phoneme, get to the phoneme. And yes, indeed, that is really important. And as we look at um, kids coming into kindergarten, that initial sound isolation as a predictive indicator is really important to keep in mind. However, Phonological awareness is a bigger notion than just phonemes, and, and syllables are also a really important element beyond phonological awareness, but also in our language related to vocabulary. So there are lots of things that we can do, and you know how many, I mean, so many of them. So different programs, there are ladders to literacy, phonemic awareness with the Hagerty program, the uh, phonemic awareness that Marilyn Adams had a lot to do with, Road to the Code, uh, Benita Blackman and uh, uh, Eileen Ball giving us such good information decades ago. There's that settled science again. Tier two programs, one and two programs, um, uh, the Torgerson and Bryant have one that is out, the LIPS program, a great one that's been around for decades. So websites that I love, I love the Florida Center for Reading Research. The uh, PALS um, site has different phonological awareness activities and Reading Rockets is another one. You probably have more and there's such a wealth of information that is available. So here we are, we started out by Talking about some research highlights, um, I hope you have a deeper understanding of those pH terms because phonological awareness doesn't live by itself. It lives within a family of other pH skills that are also um, important in the development of that broader notion of phonological processing. We talked quickly about phonological or some assessment 
uh, aspects. And in a big picture, phonological awareness and, and assessing phonological awareness skills is such a valuable um, component in a broader assessment process. And instruction, teaching phonological awareness is a really important element and aspect. It is fun, it's playful, kids love it. And it is, in my mind, if I think about the ingredients that go into good uh, learning to read and write, um, and if I think about cookies, there are all these ingredients that we can think about, the strands on the reading rope or the ingredients to make really good cookies. And in my mind, phonological awareness is the butter. It is what binds the oral language piece in learning words and learning how to play with the structures of words to the written language piece and making a connection to what those letters are, the, the job that the letters have of representing or spelling those speech sounds and putting that all together. So what I hope we have done, matching up what our goals at the start were to confirm what it is that you already know and to deepen what it is that, that we have um, deepen your understanding and knowledge of phonological awareness. We can teach it. What we don't know yet and still needs to be answered in the research is what kind of dosage we need. And it is in, in any kind of a, a workout routine, we warm up, we stretch. And that is a great way of thinking about phonological awareness in our phonics lessons. Let's key in that phonologic processing system by talking about sounds in words connect those sounds to the letters. And when we have that really good connection of sounds to letters, we're gonna have pretty good competent reading. So those are some of my thoughts. I'm anxious to see what kinds of questions you have. Uh, thank you. I mean, thank you so very, very much, Lucy. Um, if you can see the comments all throughout, um, everyone is so grateful. Uh, there's been a lot of brain cell growth uh, during your session. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask my uh, colleague, Andrew, to share some of the questions we have with you. And for those that we're not able to get to, would it be okay if we send them to you um, mm -hmm. to see if they might be answered? Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Andrea. Sure. I'm going to pick and choose a few uh, for you, Lucy. So um, are there any resources showing the mouth positions recommended um, because we're using masks so much in, in our instruction now? Um, mm -hmm. It's so... Let me go to my drawer. <laughs> yes. And I bet you have heard of them. Let's see if I can pull these out quickly. Um, Mary Dahlgren's program. I almost have them. Okay, so some great ones that are available come from this company. It's called Tools with the number four reading. And she has Kid Lips. And look at these delightful lips, <laughs> pictures, images. And you may be familiar with a lot of the conversation going on around sound walls today. And so these images show what your mouth looks like when you are saying, it's a, it's a, it's a static image, but when you are making different sounds, guess what this one is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's cool. So she has the sound here and then she also has cards that go along with it that I mean, speech sounds have a really important purpose in our written language. And so here is a graphing card or the spelling card that goes along with it. So if I find the F picture, here we go. Okay, so here's what F and V or and V look like. And then fish is the anchor picture. And then here are the different spellings for, okay? So that's one, one uh, resource that is available. I'm sure there are others. Thank you. Um, here's the question that a lot of people said, ooh, I'm uh, for a child who appears dyslexic but has average to high average phonological awareness, including automaticity, what else could be assessed to determine what is the cause of slow word reading? Assuming that standard, you know, cognitive abilities are, are um, average or above. Mm -hmm. Are in place. 
And so I know there are going to be a whole lot of other folks that are going to be able to answer that question much more um, with much more authority. But I'm thinking that phonological awareness is one aspect of phonological processing. And so if if you look at the speed at which a child is able to recall words, that rapid automatized naming, that's, that certainly is an aspect in an area that I would want to assess as well, more than just a screening. There are a number of tools, diagnostic tools that give us good information about what are some expectations for how quickly you should be able to say a different uh, different stimulus sets. And so I would look at at um, at, at that um, element. I would also want to look at phonological working memory and see how those other elements in that phonological processing system um, is working. And so then I know there's this there's a there's a good uh, field of study of looking at those resistant learners, those ones that kids that develop phonological awareness and they, they have good letter and name sound knowledge and they are slow decoders. And how that comes, how that comes ab about or comes along. I but from the phonological awareness perspective, I wanna know more than just phonological awareness. Uh, something that Kilpatrick talks about and has has some pretty good intervention studies looking at the uh, how rapidly you're able to take a word like say powder, say it again and don't say duh, and how quickly you can come up with that um, with that new recorded word. So probably not a great answer or to your question. Um, and those are those those are those tricky ones that we have to keep searching for what is going to make the best difference for that for that little friend. Thank you. Thanks. So can children who have had hearing loss um, tubes in their ears ever fully recover that finite sensitivity to sounds. Oh boy, that is an interesting one too, isn't it? Yes, because what uh, some of the research in my field identified, and this has been quite a long time, another one of those elements of settled science is that kids between the ages of about 18 months, uh, that 12 to 24 months, when there are ear infections occurring during that time period, it's not just the infection part, it's the effusion part where the gunk in the middle ear canal or the tubes, the middle ear is still there. And so speech sounds like this and you don't hear good, clear, um, you, don't, you don't build good connections to what clear, crisp sounds are. Um, I think, yes, we can help to build that. And uh, in doing that, I would recommend using some kind of auditory device to help enhance the sound quality uh, of those sounds going in. This is my this is my whisper phone. I love the PVC kinds because I can twist them and I can say something in your ear, ready, bulldozer, and then I can twist it and have my little friend say that same thing in his or her ear or their ear. Um, uh, for uh, From an intervention perspective, when there has been that neurologic inconsistency of hearing things one way, you have an ear infection and it sounds a little different now, um, then I wanna have uh, some kind of an auditory trainer of sorts, so the headphones and some kind of enhanced uh, amplified device. That was a tool that as a speech and language pathologist, I, I did not want to be without. And I would suggest anybody working with students who have, who have some kind of phonological awareness uh, delay or underdevelopment, uh, get some kind of listening device to help enhance that auditory signal. It just activates that auditory channel so that you are keying into that and uh, enhances your ability to process what it is that you're hearing. Thank you. This is a big one too. So how does advanced phonemic awareness impact literacy? Um, are, are there any studies or empirical studies that you could point to 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 link that. Well, here's where I would I would refer 
the best conversation in that regard to the person that's doing a lot of work in that advanced literacy piece, and that would be Kilpatrick. He does have studies that he has done working with older students who are teaching um, advanced phonemic awareness, your ability to play with and manipulate uh, the uh, sounds in words quickly uh, and showing some pretty significant um, increases in their reading ability. And so he has, he has intervention studies that are helping to discern that or to define that. And that it is an area, I mean, how, how long have all of us heard about or known about in this broad scope of phonological awareness building in the 90s, the advanced level? It's a very, it's a pretty recent, uh, it's, it's a pretty recent topic in the big picture. And, and research is slow to um, the application of the findings is slow to come into our, into our educational realm, into the application piece. And, and research is also messy. And we certainly want to make sure that um, in a conversation, recent conversation with Seidenberg, he assures us that those studies are being done. There's more work that's being done to help us know. Um, I know in my own anecdotal, working with students who were struggling with the reading process and when their phonological awareness skills improved, there were also significant, and I know there were significant improvements in their reading and their writing abilities. It, com it, it comes back to that question on conversation of dosage. What is going to be the right amount? How fast is fast enough? And those are questions we don't know yet, but we do have some guiding uh, hypotheses that are suggesting that this might make a difference. And if it's gonna make a difference for some of those non-responders, then uh, I, think, I think it's worth looking into. It's, it's worth looking, uh, continuing to uh, identify what the research is gonna guide us and show us. Thank you. So thinking about those advanced phonemic awareness skills, would you recommend doing addition, deletion, substitution of phonemes with kindergarten students? Okay, kinders. So when we look at that, look at their trajectory of development, that's gonna be a harder skill for kids. And there are programs out there that are doing a lot of those deletion kinds of things in pre-K. Mm -hmm. And when you look at um, you look at the phonological awareness learning outcomes, because kids are participating to greater extents today, there's more phonological awareness being taught in an explicit level today than there was 10 years ago, because we have more tools that are available to us. And, and so in that regard, the phonological awareness levels are increasing or they're, they're better. Um, on one side, when we think about a program that might teach a whole range of early basic to complex skills in the same lesson, what the way I like to frame that is that, that I, I would consider that to be a pretty good tier one program. And in our classes, we're going to have kids who are on that lower level of phonological awareness development. We're going to have kids who are on that higher level of phonological awareness development. These kids over here are going to have skills that are going to match up with where they're at, or tasks matching up with where they're at. They're also exposed to those other tasks that are higher up in the progression. These kids are going to have practice in making sure that those earlier developing skills are working well. It's like that you start an aerobic activity, you have a little stretching that goes on ahead of time. It's like, oh, I stretched yesterday, I don't know how to stretch. <laughs> no, you do that all the time. It's like greasing the wheels. It is the fluidness that gets that phonologic system activated and working. And so they have also in that kind of a program, they have tasks that are going to meet their needs. Now, when there's a time constraint, I would say from an assessment perspective in pre-K or in those early grades, assessing those higher level manipulation tasks because they're not gonna be very predictive. For a screening task, that may not be the best use of your time. If it takes a couple of minutes to do the entire lesson, 
it's fun. It's enjoyable. It's playful. It's greasing the skids to get to. Let's let's uh, match these sounds up now with the letters and the letter patterns that we need to use. Then I think it's probably a it's a it, it, it may be a valuable use of time. For students where phonological awareness is not developing very well, and based in what we know about how sequential instruction may need to be for those students, then an approach that has a variety of skills may not, or tasks may not be the best approach for tier two and three students. Thank you. So a lot of comments throughout your presentation were the participants really loved all the grade level, specific grade level um, kind of uh, benchmarks and thinking about what is what is correct at a grade level. This question is about second grade. Um, should children up to second grade continue with phonemic awareness even if they have mastered the skills in Hagerty or those who just need it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then it comes back to this, this prong. What's the purpose of doing this activity? Mm -hmm. Is it a warm up? Let's activate your phonologic system. Then I'd say yes. If it's a task that we're going to do this because this is something that is required or and this is what it says to do on page on, on week seven, without understanding and knowing why it is you're doing that, then I'm going to question it. And, and you know, it comes down to, and this is something that we that I, I, you all know, is that a program is not going to teach children phonological awareness. You, as the ed educator, you as the teacher, are going to teach phonological awareness. The program that you use is the tool. And depending on how valuable that tool is, is how well that job can help you, how about that tool can help you do that job. There are programs that are out there that have some instruction. There are programs that are a lot of modeling and a lot of imitation. That's one layer of, of teaching, guiding, but it, it is not an, that it, it doesn't teach you the why or the what that you're doing. You're just imitating and copying in, in, in some contexts, in some situations. So your knowledge and understanding what that is, how that works, what is the purpose for this particular activity and you can define and describe it and you know why and you know what the learning outcomes are, what the expectations are, then do it. But if you're just doing it because it's filling an activity or oh, I'm supposed to do phonological awareness today, let's do this. That's not gonna give you the best learning outcomes that your children need from us. Thank you. I know we have a minute left, so I'm going to check in with Pam and see if, um... Um, I think uh, we will send the other questions to you, Lucy. I think you, uh, Andrew was very judicious in um, asking the questions we, that were people said, I really want to know the answer to this one. So we will definitely uh, send you the others and we will include it um, on the Padlet, those answers. So thank you so very much. There's been a lot of conversation about phonology recently. And I have to say that you have uh, definitely broadened and deepened our understanding in phonology and phonemic awareness in a way that um, we're extremely grateful for. Thank you so, so very, very much. We've seen thank yous all the way through here. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. We're truly grateful. Well, you're so welcome. I'm so honored to have had the opportunity. It is quite an honor. I'm, I'm humbled by, <laughs> by all of this. Well, the honor thank was all ours. <laughs> for everything that, that you do. And truly, for those of you uh, teachers, thank you. Your dedication and commitment to the kids in your care is uh, it's, it is so admirable, and I, I have so much respect for you. Yeah, so here, they, here we are uh, an hour and a half in into the evening uh, after working a long day and everyone's here uh, learning. So we, we are very grateful to everyone attending. I did put in the chat earlier that our next opportunity to be together will be April 27th, and we will be joined by Dr. Louisa Motes who will be focusing our learning and learn study on uh, decoding and phonics. And then the following month in May, uh, Dr. David Kilpatrick will join us with site recognition. So we'll then close up uh, the word recognition strands uh, in May, but then all through the summer and into the fall, we'll be digging into those language comprehension strands. So please join us. Um, I want to thank my colleagues, Andrew Bell, Jeannie Hertzler, Sherry Hartman. Um, I saw Karen Derry popped in here, Nancy Hennessy, who's been, um, 
partnering with us here. Deb Fulton, who was a former state lead, thank you for coming back. Um, and thank you 